Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, it's Susan Coffin here for Attitude Magazine. I'm hosting our weekly ADHD experts broadcast. And this webinar is the final in our four-part ADHD awareness webinar series. Great topic, great speaker this week. We have Kirk Martin of Celebrate Calm here to talk about building confidence in our own parenting skills to build confidence in our children, confidence that they really need because on average, research tells us that children with attention and executive function deficits, by the time they're 12, has re have received as many as 20,000 more negative messages than their, their neuro, as we call them, neurotypical peers. So these negative comments um, desperately need to be counterbalanced with positive parenting techniques at home. Kirk Barton of Celebrate Calm is going to talk to us about what positive parenting looks like on a day-to-day -day basis what you can do, how it works to boost your children's self-esteem, and he'll be giving us strategies for things like how to replace the constant negativity and messages around ADHD, how to motivate kids who don't respond to consequences on, a, on an ordinary way, how to help accentuate kids' positive qualities, and this is a really important one, how to help our teachers help our children at school. And then finally, how to stop power struggles by understanding why your kids are bossy, cheat, are defiant, have meltdowns, and all the other kinds of behavior issues that we all live with. Kirk, thank you so much for being here today. We are always happy to have you at Attitude Magazine. We feel very fortunate about Kirk a little bit. He is the founder of Celebrate Calm. Check out his website. It's wonderful, celebratecalm.com. And he is a super in-demand expert all over the United States and the world, actually, and give, giving workshops and programs on parenting strong-willed children and children with special needs. He's worked with over 600,000 parents and teachers in over 19 countries, providing very practical strategies to stop yelling, to stop defiance, to stop power struggles, and some of the topics he's just going to be able to touch on today. Um, you'll find, as I said, much more about Kirk and his programs at CelebrateCalm.com. So with that, let me introduce, turn it over to Kirk. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. You guys have so many good resources that actually helped when we were raising our own son. So it's kind of really cool to come back many years later and then hopefully provide some tools for some other parents going through this because, you know, you've got these kids who often feel like failures because they struggle with everything. And so I try to, when I'm working with kids, kind of get inside their heads, right? Like, what is their day like? And if we're honest, in some ways, this is what we do with our kids. And I'll call them our kids who have ADHD and who struggle with these issues. It's kind of like we've said, your whole childhood is based on uh, good behavior and doing well in school, which happen to be the two things that you struggle most with in life because you're not naturally great all the time at just sitting still, listening to someone talk, following directions. It's kind of like you're, we've, in some ways, not setting them up for failure, but it's hard. And so it's kind of like for us as parents, like if you had to go to a job every day that you weren't equipped to do and no one trained you how to do it, by the end of the day, by the end of the first week, you'd be like, man, I stink at this. And so what happens with many of our kids is you'll hear them start to say, like, I'm dumb, stupid. I wish I hadn't been born um, because they're starting to feel like failures. So we're going to address that today. But the other part um, that's really important is, is helping you, right, to feel confident because these kids are tough um, because most of these kids that we work with, they don't respond to consequences. I know most of you, you've done the right stuff, right? Like you tell your kids, like, here are the rules, here are the consequences. And then you followed through, you were consistent. And many of your kids just don't care. And so you're like, what do I do now? And you get judged by people because other parents are like, oh, well, if you would just discipline the right way, your kids wouldn't have ADHD. And, and you know, you, you get that stuff all the time. So I want to try to give you some confidence um, and, and know that if you're struggling with your child, that makes you normal, right? All those parents who look like they've got everything together and their kids are great and everything's going well, I guarantee you, I work with them all the time. They are 
falling apart. So if you're struggling, it's, it's normal. And I wanted to address and kind of bring up one other thing that's really hard, especially for moms. And I know this because I did this to my wife. A lot of times when you have kids with special needs, it will begin to divide the parents because, and this is in general, now it can be opposite, but in general, moms tend to be the ones who are super engaged and you guys are reading books and you're on the internet late at night and you're looking up stuff and coming up with solutions and you're trying different things. And that was what my wife would do. And when my son was young, I would come home and say, you know what? You're just coddling him. You're being too soft on him. And she would be like, yeah, and you're a hard, you know what? And so moms sometimes have this really hard dilemma, right? Where you don't want your husband or your spouse to come in and kind of just bring all this negativity on your child. But if you speak up to your husband, well, then it's like I'm undermining his authority. So it's a really tough position to be in. So later on, we'll try to address kind of how to get on the same page as a parent. You won't always parent the same way, right? Like I'm always going to be tougher on my son than my wife is, but we're on the same page and we have same goals and kind of a similar approach, if that makes sense. So I wanted to go ahead and um, just as a setup and kind of just let you know what our approach is. And um, thank you, because I didn't know how to uh, advance the slide and I think you did that for me. So thank you. So um, very quickly on the Celebrate Calm methodology is two things I want to get to today are, are this. The reason that consequences and that behavior charts, you know, those ones at schools where they use the red, yellow, and green behavior chart, I hate those things because most of your kids, within five minutes of getting to school, they're already on red. And what they end up saying inside is, if I'm going to be on red today, I may as well just double down and make it a really bad day. Because the truth is I'm never going to get to green. And so they begin to shut down. And that happens because we tend not to get to the root of the issue. And we'll do that today, getting to the root and seeing what's really going on inside your child's heart and inside his brain. And then secondly, giving kids tools to succeed. Because just saying you need to focus better. Well, if it were that easy, your child would have done that back in September and not lost all his stuff or you just need to have better impulse control. Again, if it were that easy, they would have done it. So we'll go through some of that. And many of you know our story, I'll just tell it briefly. I've got a very, very strong-willed son. My son Casey was diagnosed with just about everything. He's kind of had that alphabet soup of things from ADHD to a little bit of OCD, even some ODD, sensory issues. And so, our vision was instead of just bringing kids into a therapeutic office, which is really helpful, I wanted to have groups of kids, like five, 10, 15 kids at a time in my home where I could control the environment. So I could make sure that I changed plans on the kids at the last minute. Well, you know, your kids don't deal well with last minute changes. They don't deal well with transitions. So they would start to get upset and they would start to have a little meltdown. And the goal was not to torture kids. It was so in the moment when they're melting down, I could look at them and say, hey, I can tell you're really frustrated right now. I can tell you're disappointed and you're not getting what you want. And so you've got a couple options here. Now you can throw things, you can yell, you can scream, you can bite, you can hit, you can do those things if you want, but I know it doesn't feel good. So if you'd rather deal with your frustration and disappointment in another way, I can show you how to do that. And so the reason I wanted them in my home is so we could get them kind of in the moment teaching them how to do it. So hopefully you'll find that a lot of this today is very, very practical. So um, we're going to look at um, five tools um, from we've got a program. It's called ADHD University um, that to kind of reverse that negative cycle and replace it with concrete positive strategies to build your child's confidence. So number one, replacing that negative stigma of ADHD with confidence so that your, um, you know, your, your, your kids don't feel inferior to siblings and peers. And um, you know, a lot of it is going to be the way that we as adults view our kids. And I always like to tell people, you know, if society valued different traits, your kids would feel very different about themselves and so would you. So I want to read you something that I wrote recently. 
And I sent this out. Um, you know, if you email me, I will send this to you. It's just, it's on our website. It's Kirk, K-R-K at CelebratePalm.com. I'll send this to you because it may be easier to read. But imagine this. So this is a note that a, a teacher would send home to parents of, say, neurotypical kids. And it may sound like this. You know what? I'm really concerned about Christopher's, Christopher's behavior. He lacks initiative. He just sits perfectly still all day waiting for me to tell him what to do. Perhaps he's energy deficient. I'm concerned because he's not very curious. He doesn't blurt out or ask questions incessantly like my other students. I'm concerned because he's too compliant. I fear he'll be a people pleaser. He never questions anything. He just always does what is asked. He's not very creative. He colors inside the lines and he follows the directions when building Legos. I'm concerned that when he gets into the real world, he won't have the skills to manage a dynamic environment without being told what to do all the time. He's capable of being more creative if he would just apply himself. We'd like to do some testing to determine what is wrong with your son. Now, of course, that note never gets sent home because, uh, because we all like kids who are just compliant and do what they're told and don't cause any problems, right? But what if teachers began sending a note home to you about your child, and what if it said this? Man, I absolutely love having Jacob in my class. He's so curious. He's always asking questions. When he's not interested in the topic I'm teaching about, he'll find five other subjects that really fire his imagination, and he's persistent in learning about them. He's got great critical thinking skills. He always presents the opposite argument, and I love that other students are exposed to his thinking because he isn't afraid to question everything I say. Now watch, some of this is a little bit sarcastic, right? Because we don't like to question everything we say, but there are a lot of good things in there, right? With their critical thinking skills. So let's continue. You know what, your son is so creative. He's one of the few students who doesn't color in the lines. He has the confidence to draw from a different perspective than the one that I have asked for. He's constantly using the fidgets I've given him quietly, and I love that because it means his brain is awake and he's tuned in even when he's not giving me eye contact. I'm excited about Jacob's future because he's a born leader and he's not afraid to delegate to others. Plus, he's got a really huge heart. It's an honor to teach your son. Sometimes I feel like I learn as much about myself when I teach him. Now, imagine that that we started viewing our kids through a different prism. Can you imagine your son walking into that teacher's class knowing that guy, that teacher, she loves my class. She loves that I'm curious. And they're going to have their head high and they're going to be actively learning. And the byproduct is, of that as well is that child's going to work really hard for that teacher who believes in him. And so later I'm going to give you some tools to give your teachers to help with the blurting out, to help with some of those things that your kids are doing in class. But I did want to begin with, with kind of having a well-balanced perspective of our kids. And so here's where it comes to you as parents. You can't control how teachers treat your kids, but you do have complete control over how you and your spouse do it. So these are pretty easy ones, and you're going to know to do this. But begin to evaluate, value and affirm the right qualities begin to think what are the qualities necessary for success in life. Not just school, but life. Because in life, I want kids who are persistent and curious, who ask questions. And for many of you, that's who your kids are. Um, try not to get sucked into comparing your kids to siblings or their peers because they will never, ever measure up. And that's when they start to shut down and they get angry and inside they're saying, I'm not my sister. I don't think like her and I can't be like her. Stop holding me up to that standard. So you're going to have to find where your kids are and determine what we really value. Um, I believe that your kids will pick up on your confidence in them, right? So you've got to really work at this. And it's hard, I know, because... When your kids are in school, it is a constant, constant stream, usually of negatives coming home from the classroom or from the Taekwondo class. And it's hard not to get kind of depressed and down about your child's future. 
But you're going to have to actively counter that, know deep down that even though your child struggles now, he's going to be very successful. I'm going to give you one thing I hadn't thought about before, prepared for, but see if this makes sense. So most of you probably have kids who play video games a lot. And if you have a middle school child, I guarantee, I know what he's doing tonight. He's sitting in a hoodie sweatshirt and he's playing video games all night. And he's going to do that for the next probably three or 400 nights, probably in the same hoodie sweatshirt. And you're going to get frustrated and you're going to get nervous and anxious and think, who is going to marry this child? Who would possibly hire this child? Because you're not seeing them exhibit the kind of traits that we want to see. But here's a different way to look at it. And this is actually a really cool thing that I did with my son about 10 years ago when he was about 12 that changed our relationship. I walked into the little room where he's playing his video games and instead of lecturing, you know, when we were kids, we were outside playing. You don't have any friends, all those things. I said, Casey, I'm really curious, which, by the way, is a great phrase for the kids. I'm curious. Why do you play video games? What do you get out of this? And he started to tick off all these things. Dad, when I play video games, I'm in complete control. I know what to expect. The rules are the same. Consequences are the same all the time. It's immediately stimulating. I'm really good at video games because I'm very strategic. I'm a good thinker. That's why I'm good at arguing, Minecraft, video games, chess, checkers, right? It's all in the same place. And dad, I feel good about myself when I play video games because it's something I can do well. And I connect with my friends that way. So I began, so two things popped in my head. One is this. If a child is doing an activity like playing video games and it's meeting all of those needs inside of him, right? Social skills, confidence, it's in his control, it's stimulating. Doesn't it make sense that they'd want to play? So if I want to get them off of video games, I, of course I can say no and I need to have limits and I can go Amish and cut off electricity. But my real goal is to find other activities that meet those same needs. And when we get to the last slide, I'll go through some things, whether it's service projects and starting a business. But what I wanted to hit on this, on this slide is this. I remember stopping in my son's doorway and I looked around and I looked him in the eyes and said, Casey, you know what I just realized? You have every quality necessary for success in life inside of you already. And I've seen it. And I've seen it when you play video games, because when you play video games, you all are goal oriented, you are driven and you are persistent because your sole goal in life is to get to the next level of that video game and you put everything into it. When you care about something, you can do anything you put your mind to. Now, that's true, isn't it? But the hard part as a parent is what you're thinking is, but they don't put that same effort and persistence into their homework and their chores and their study skills and practicing piano, and they don't yet. But if you just go through their childhood noticing all the things they're not doing, they will eventually shut down and give up. So I want you to affirm the good things that they are doing, if that makes sense. Okay, number two. Let's get on to get helping teachers. Help teachers give our kids tools to succeed by improving all those different skills our kids need in, in class. So I'm going to try to give you a couple examples. Um, in person, it's a lot better because you can see it, but I just want you to kind of picture these things. So um, I'm going to try to go through three very, very quickly. One is called a sensory strip. And just picture in your mind, picture this little strip. It's a, it could be Velcro. It could be double-sided tape. And it's about, it's about eight or 10 inches long, right? Not very long. And I, I use one with double-sided tape. And then I pull back one side of the double-sided tape. And on the other side, I tape on there a couple different little textury strips, just little things. I mean, it could be sandpaper, it could be felt, it could be rabbit's fur. There's research that shows when kids play with textured objects, it improves concentration. And many of you have kids who are playing with things in their hands all the time. That's good for you to know. And a, a little side note is this, observe your kids. Your kids will tell you everything they need by what they do. So that child who's playing with things and some of your kids will chew on their shirts and their sleeves because it's stimulating their brains. So what I want to give a child is a small fidget some kind of sensory strip is what we call it. 
and I peel back the other side of the double sided tape and I tape this little strip right underneath their desk at school. So if you can picture this, I'm a child sitting in class. I'm getting bored. I need to move a little bit. Well, I can't do that in class. I'm going to get in trouble and it's inappropriate. But your child reaches under his desk and he starts playing with this little sensory strip. It has these little different sensory things under it. You know, even the head of a toothbrush. If you've ever played with the head of a toothbrush, those bristles are really interesting. And what's happening is it's creating neural connections in the brain while he's playing with that. And the beautiful part about the sensory strip or a tooth, uh, uh, head of a toothbrush is it doesn't make any noise. Nobody can see it. And it's actually helping your child concentrate in class. So kind of take that older kids, you can't do the sensory strip because they'll kind of get beat up for having a sensory strip. But you can use, you can get pens and pencils that have a textured grip. You can sew things in their hoodie sweatshirt, put things in their binder, something for them to um, fidget with that's quiet and doesn't distract other kids. So second tool. Many of your kids have trouble with impulse control and they've got a lot of energy. So about 17 minutes into class, they're up walking around or they're talking to other people. And I can do the traditional negative route, which is Jacob, Jacob, hey, hey, sit down, sit down, take your seat right now or I'm going to take away recess. It never changes anything because we're just telling him to stop doing something, but we're not giving him something appropriate to do. So big principle. When you tell your kids to stop doing something, you have to give them something appropriate to do. So this is the water bottle example. Bam, example. I'm a teacher. Here's my language. Jacob, I could really use your help because you guys know those are magic words for your, your kids. They don't like helping you, but they love helping other adults and feeling uh, useful. So listen, Jacob, here's what's going to happen in my class. When I teach, my mouth gets really dry and I need your help. So after about 17 minutes in class, listen, you and I are going to have this secret signal. And I wish you could see me, but I may touch my ear. It may be touching my head. Whatever it is, a small little secret signal. And so, Jacob, when you see me do that, here's what I want you to do. You get up out of your seat. You come up to my desk and you grab my water bottle. You take it to the back of the room. You refill it. Then you bring it back up and sit it on my desk and you are going to sit down. You don't get to distract anybody. You don't get to talk to anybody. You're going to be Mr. Invisible. You up for that? And again, little kids love being Mr. Invisible. Older kids, you gotta leave that part out. So watch, 17 minutes into class, or for some of your kids, it's gonna be seven minutes in class. I'm losing that child. But instead of all the negative energy going to, ah, 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 Jacob, Jacob, look, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. Now I give him this little secret signal. He's like, oh, I got a job to do gets up, walks up to my desk, grab the water bottle. He takes it to the back of the room, refills it, sits it on my desk. And here's why I like this example. I just gave this student 22 seconds of appropriate movement within my boundaries. I didn't say, hey, little guy with an ADHD brain, I know you got to move, go run around my class when you get bored. I didn't say that. It was a very specific, concrete job. He can hold that water bottle. He feels it. He sees it being filled up, right? And so it's very concrete. But I gave him very specific. I didn't say, hey, I, I, I told him, I said, you don't get to talk to anybody. You're not going to distract anybody. I need you to be Mr. Invisible because it's just a job we're doing for me. But I created a success because if we don't create a success, eventually that child in class is just going to get up and walk around and I'm going to have to redirect him. He's going to get in trouble. I'm going to mark him down. He's going to be on red. He's going to go to the principal's office. Teacher's going to send a note home to you that your child doesn't know how to listen or control himself. And then you're going to lecture your child. And look, it just becomes endless negativity. I created a success. Now, here's a cool little extra thing I get to do as a teacher. I do that for a week. The next week, Jacob comes into my class and I say, hey, Man, last week, you're a great helper. We're going to do that again this week, but here's what we're going to do. I believe you can sit in my class for 23 minutes before you need to move. So I notice that you need to move after about 17 minutes, so I'll glance at you so that you know that I know that you're struggling. But I'm going to go on teaching my class because I believe you can sit for an additional seven minutes longer before you need to refill my water bottle. And so after 23, 24 minutes, give him a signal, he does that. And so I'm slowly beginning to teach the child 
impulse control, but I'm doing it with a concrete tool and he's learning to be successful. And so I will wrap up that part by saying, uh, when it comes to setting objectives for your kids, know where they are, set reasonable expectations. Some kids can sit for an hour at a time and they're just fine. Some of your kids, if they're only sitting for nine minutes, but then I get them up to 17 minutes and 22 minutes and then 23 minutes, 27 minutes, I've made progress. So if, if you want to remember this phrase, I go for progress, not perfection. Now, some of you listening, you have husbands who have really high expectations and they think you're coddling the sun. But what happens with a lot of dads is we set the bar so high that the child can never meet that standard. And again, they begin to shut down. Final example is this for your kids who blurt out. I'll do this one quickly. I, I've got it written out a talk ticket. So if you imagine a teacher just creates or mom, dad, you create this for the teacher, three little cardboard strips of uh, 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 strips of cardboard. And they're going to be tickets, a talk ticket. Sounds like this. Listen, Christopher, here's what I need help with in my class. I'm going to give you three talk tickets because I know that you struggle with blurting out. And I know why you blurt out my class. And by the way, this is really important to give your kids wisdom and to know why they blurt out. Christopher, you've got this awesome brain and it's really busy. You've got a busy brain. You've all, you got all these ideas. You're like a junior Thomas Edison man. I love your ideas. And you get really excited about your ideas, but then you're afraid you're going to forget your idea. So you blurt out my class and that's unacceptable. So a couple things to notice right now, and I'll uh, give you the tool for this. I said it was unacceptable, which is fine because it is unacceptable, but I don't call the child rude. I don't assign a motive to their behavior. So do try to watch that. Like using those, using those, phrase, those phrases, phrases uh, uh, that'll cause kids to shut down. But I explain to the child, I know why you're blurting out. It's not because you're a rude, defiant kid. It's because you have this great brain. You're great with ideas, but you just struggle with short-term memory. And so you blurt out. That makes sense to me. Now, I don't want you to do it in my class. So here's the tool I'm going to give you. Every day when you walk in my class, I give you three talk tickets. Here's how it works. When you want to share something with me, instead of blurting out, I want you to hold up a talk ticket. I will either say, go ahead, redeem a talk ticket. You get three a day. Share your amazing off-topic idea because that's what it's going to be. Or I'm going to say, zip, hold it till after class because I believe you can do that. And the reality is that afternoon, the child's going to be like, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, the new Star Wars video game's coming out Friday. And then he's going to hold up his talk ticket because he has something concrete to do. And this is really important and we'll feed into the next slide. Now watch where the intensity of the teacher, of the adult goes. I get to praise and affirm that child and say, Christopher, you know, it was really cool. You really wanted to blurt out. You really wanted to share that idea. You started to, but then you caught yourself. You held up your talk ticket. That's what self-control looks like. That's impulse control. And that's how we do it in my class. And then I give that child a fist bump. That is so powerful for these kids. Can you imagine your kids in class or at home when they make a good choice? Dad, mom, teacher coming along saying, hey, that's the way we do it in this home and giving a little fist bump, I guarantee you I will own that child in my classroom. He will come in every day eager to please me because I am giving him tools and I'm affirming when he makes progress in my class. And I hope that makes sense. So that kind of feeds into slide number three, which is motivating kids who don't respond to the negative consequences. It's giving kids positive intensity. Your kids don't want your attention. They want your intensity. The human brain is drawn to intensity. So here's your homework for the next three days. I want you purposefully, intentionally, and consciously catching your child making good choices and then give them intensity when they do that. Because you guys know this, and I'm the same way. When do our kids usually get our intensity? When they do something wrong. How many times do I have to tell, if I have to tell you one more, all that intensity begins to change the structure of the child's brain. So I want to rewire that 
And what happens when I begin affirming and saying, now this is going to be kind of facetious, but not really. When I've got two siblings, right, what do we end up doing? You guys can't even play well together for 20 minutes. But for 19 and a half minutes, there is no bloodshed. So occasionally walk in the living room when they're actually playing well and say, hey, guys, listen, you guys have been playing well together for the last seven and a half minutes. Shows me you're growing up. And then walk right out of the room. Don't make it a big deal when you praise them. It's simple, even, matter of fact. You're just affirming it. You're planting a seed because some of your kids, when you praise them, they will actually argue with you. So I don't want that. So again, homework. Um, if you're a mom listening to this, share this with your husband and say, listen, we've tried the negative route. We've done that since the day this child has been born. If it was going to work, it would have worked by then. And that's what I share with the teachers. And I go in and share with the teachers and say, listen, I know it's tough teaching my child. It's tough. But we've tried the negative behavior chart thing. It's not working. So for the next week, could if I brought in a sensory strip, could we try that underneath his desk? If I brought in some water bottles, could you just give my child jobs to do when he's, when he's kind of getting out of control a little bit because he loves, loves, loves helping? And instead of using the behavior chart, every time my child makes a good choice, we give him a little check mark on his, uh, on his sheet. We start sending home some positive reports. And let's see how that changes behavior. Let's try that for two weeks. And then I'll meet back up with you. and We'll see if that's making a difference. So I want the conversation with the spouses and, and with teachers to go from, what are we going to take away? Two, hey, our child's struggling in this area, no doubt. No excuses for that. He's struggling. But what are two or three different uh, tools we can give him to succeed? Okay, number four. I'm going to do this quickly because I, 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 I know we need to get on to um, questions. I want to understand why your, our kids are bossy, why some of your kids cheat at games, why they become defiant, why they have meltdowns, so we can stop the power struggles. So... If we had three hours, I would do all of this. But let me give you kind of two quick examples. Some of your kids who are bossy at times. I remember we had these kids at our camp. We ended up inviting like 1,500 kids into our home. And so we'd have after school camps, kids would come over and do homework with me. And they were always bossy after school. And my first thought is the same thing that's in your brain at times. Why are you being such a bossy little jerk? No wonder you don't have any friends. Now, that's what I was thinking. Don't say that. But I remember stepping back one day and thinking, okay, give me some, I need some wisdom here. What's really going on? And I stepped back and I looked at this child and said, you know what? I think I know what's going on. You've got this really busy brain. You're always thinking of stuff and right. And, and, but it feels like it's kind of out of control at sometimes. And you go to school and teachers and people are telling you what to do all day long. And you never really have control or ownership of anything. And you come to my house and it's loud and noisy. And so when life feels like it's out of control for you, you start to try to control other people and boss them around. Now, listen, I only know that because I'm the same exact way. When I get tired at night, I get bossy with people. So listen, J Jacob, Jennifer, whoever the child is, you're not just a bossy. You're not a bossy jerk. You're just an overwhelmed child who feels like everything's out of control. So listen, you don't need to be in control in my home because I am and everything's cool. But here are two things you could do for me that would really help me out. And I would always give them a couple jobs to do in areas that play to their strengths. I got a lot of kids who are little mentors. So I say, oh, you know what I need help with? My broom broke. broke. It's in the basement. I've got some duct tape. If you could fix my broom for me, it would really help me out. And so this child would go from being bossy or being irritated to now he's being helpful. He's completing a specific job. And it's making him feel very grounded. So when your kids come home from school or when you pick them up from daycare, whatever it is, when you get home, try to give them a sense of ownership, maybe something. And this only has to take seven, eight minutes. But before you jump into, OK, let me check your homework folder. Got to go. Got to do your work. Let's go. I'm going to stand over you for, 50, for, you know, for three hours. Give them some ownership. And you may even say with little kids, hey, I hid something in the backyard. Hid your favorite Lego in the fire backyard, but you can't find it before before we get started on homework or in the next 12 minutes, right? Or, hey, mom's on the way home from work. Why don't you hide something in the basement? We'll see if mom can find it when she gets home. You're giving the child some sense of ownership or control over something within your boundaries. One other quick one, instead of asking how your child's day was at school, because many of your kids, to be quite honest, they didn't have a good day at school and they don't want to talk about it. 
And so it sounds like an interrogation. That's what I'll say. It was fine. What did you do? Nothing. Got any homework? Nope. Try this this afternoon. Say, hey, I want to tell you something, share something that happened to me today at the office or in traffic or wherever. Share a story from your day and say, what would you do if you were in my position? Because how often do we ask kids for their opinions and actually listen? It's just a cool little trick. So the other one I'll do on this very quickly is many of your kids have meltdowns when they go to new places because they have a lot of anxiety. And it will sound like this. No, I'm not going. Taekwondo stupid. You are stupid. And we immediately think it's defiance. But when you start to understand what's going on, you find out that your child probably has anxiety over going to new places because it's all the scary unknowns. Like, what, what, what if I'm not good at it? What if the other kids pick on me? What, I, I have auditory processing issues and following uh, directions is hard. What if I'm not good at Taekwondo? And what if I get in trouble there? And what if I'd want to quit? And dad calls, is going to call me a quitter. And all this stuff is going through his brain. And he finally just says, no, I'm not going. You are stupid. And the reason is he wants the punishment. He wants to get sent to his room because he'd rather take the known quantity, which is I'm going to take everything away and you're going to your room, than go to that new place. But when I understand that it's not a defiance issue, it's an anxiety issue, I can look at him and say, listen, totally get why you'd be anxious because you've got to, you're going to a new place. I get nervous when I go new places. There's nothing wrong. You probably have a little thing in your stomach. Stomach's probably a little bit upset. Yeah, that's what happens when you get a little bit nervous. Listen, totally get why you're nervous. Should be a little bit nervous, but you're going to be fine. And here's how I'm going to help you out. And the way I overcome anxiety with new places is, to have teachers and Taekwondo instructors, grandparents, wherever your child's going, have an adult give that child a job to do because that is very, very grounding for these kids. So I'm gonna go and um, I already mentioned this one, number five, accentuating their positive qualities, use their gifts and passions in purple, purposeful ways so they can succeed. So I'd encourage you with this and then I'll wrap up so we can do questions. Your kids have big hearts. so service projects. Get your kids involved, feeding the homeless, raising money for people. Your kids love stuff like that. Some of your kids are great with animals. So get them working with animals. Some of your kids, by the way, are great with younger kids, not siblings, but younger kids. Get them volunteering somewhere, reading to children, working in a daycare. And some of your kids, many of them are very entrepreneurial and they love money. So get them creating and using their own business. And here's the big idea that I want you to kind of sink your teeth into. When many kids are at school and who, many kids who do well in school, they're using their gifts and passions at school. They're good at school. And so they get rewarded. Good grades, uh, dean's list, they're going to do great. It's going to be an awesome future. Your kids sometimes aren't great at school. So you have to put them in positions, put them in different circumstances in the neighborhood, in the community, at your church or synagogue, wherever, where your kids can use their gifts and do something really well so they feel good about themselves. The number one way to build confidence, it's not going to be just through verbally telling your kids that they're wonderful. Confidence comes from one thing, doing something I'm good at doing and doing it well. And then if you can add this, helping other people, oh, that feels really good. So you find, find an older couple in your neighborhood who needs help walking their dog or changing light bulbs or doing something. Because if your child can go to that person's house or goes to feed the homeless and sees that he's making a difference, that feels really good inside. And they get to see, I may not be great at listening, uh, listening in class or writing, or memorizing math facts. But man, I'm good at building stuff for Habitat for Humanity. Man, I'm good at helping feed the homeless. I'm great with animals. So I'll leave it at that. If you have other questions, we're gonna do questions. If you have other questions, you can email me anytime. It's just kirk at celebratecalm.com. And we've got a Facebook page, Celebrate Calm, and you ask questions there, because I wanna help. Okay, I'm done with my slides, so, and I apologize hey, for that. Kirk. So um, lots of posts here saying 
that you get you get their, you you are describing people's lives who are listening. You are describing their children, and a lot of gratitude for that first comment you made about the fact that um, you don't always get support when you try to tackle this problem. So, with that in mind, and 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 uh, lots of good questions, um, I want to just talk. Uh, briefly about the oppositional behavior a little further. Example from one person said precisely, I really try to catch my child being good and give him lots of praise, but then he turns around and does exact opposite just to show that I can't control him. Any ideas? So I think that that oppositional behavior is pretty, you know, pretty tough to deal with. It's really, really tough. And I know what that is like because I'm made that way. I'm a difficult person in that sense. And so here's, listen, I am not a doctor. So you're going to have to, when it comes to the diagnosis of, of, of ODD diagnosis, you have to defer to a psychiatrist or a doctor. I'm not. So I can't speak to the diagnosis. What I can speak to is my experience with these kids, which is this. Most of them are not defiant kids. They're really, really frustrated kids. They're very bright kids, but school's boring and stupid. Now, those are their words. I'm not meaning to offend you. They don't see the application. And so what happens is, and, and plus here's what else going on. They're really bright, so they like a challenge, and everything's boring. And, and if you listen to any of our curriculum and, and, or come to a live workshop, you'll hear us talk about giving kids ownership. And you heard a little of that. I don't give kids control of my home, but these strong-willed oppositional kids, I will just tell you this, they're never, ever going to do things the way you want it done. So let me put the, give you this framework. What I began doing with my own son and with so many of these oppositional kids was saying this, hey, here's the goal. Here are my expectations. Here are my boundaries. Here are my rules. This is what I am looking for. I'm going to create a big box for you to live in, kind of conceptually. And here's how it works. As long as we accomplish the same task, the same objective, I don't care how you get it done. And so I'm not saying if you want to do your homework. Oh, no, homework has to get done. I just don't care how you get it done. If you want to do it in a weird way, if you want to hang off the sofa upside down while listening to music and do your homework, I'm all over that. If you want to stand at the kitchen counter and rock back and forth while listening to music and chewing a snack, if you want to do your homework in the closet. By the way, many kids, it's weird, but weird stuff works with these kids. Ask them, say, I don't care where you want to do it. And I'll come back to this in a second, but do it in a closet. I have many kids in classrooms because we do a lot of teacher training um, all across the country. And teachers just need tools, right? Teachers... I'll say this on behalf of teachers, they're not trained in this stuff. They're not. And all they know, their only go-to usually is take stuff away, negative discipline. So we've got to help our teachers get these tools as well, right? So um, I have a lot of kids who will do better classwork sitting underneath the desk. So ownership is, I don't care how you get it done. I'll give you another one, morning routine. Listen, here's the deal. School bus comes at 7, 17 a.m. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care what's in your stomach. I just want you on that school bus at 717. If you're smart enough to wear the clothes to bed that you're going to wear to school the next day, you can sleep in until 715, roll out of bed, grab some of that food that you hid underneath your bed, and eat it on the school bus on the, on the way to school. I don't care. But if you're on the school bus at 717, I'm just going to let you know, good job. Now, is that a little bit of a funny example? Kind of, but the principle with that strong-willed oppositional child is this. The more that you care about something and the more that you lecture and try to get them to do it your way, I can only give you this promise. They will always, always, always resist that. And there is nothing you can take away. There is no threat that will get through to them. But see if this makes sense. Sometimes when you step back and when you give them some freedom to own their choices and to do things differently than you would do it, as long as we get it done, sometimes you liberate them, you free them to do it, but they're doing it because they're doing it their way. But again, within your boundaries, I hope that makes sense because 
I can only tell you after working with so many families, you can't use the harsh approach on that strong-willed child because he's up for the fight and he loves the fight and it stimulates his brain so much. And you've already seen this in your home with that child. You've tried the hard approach. He just digs in. You're like, I'm not going to feed you until you do that. He's like, fine, I won't eat. And you're going to give in because he will outlast you. But sometimes, you know, I'll throw another one in. And this is a weird word to use in this context, humility. I found that sometimes humility as a parent is a really powerful tool for the strong-willed child because they're already strong-willed and they're expecting the fight because everywhere they go, they get the hard approach. And sometimes I don't let them do what they want. Again, I'm not giving in, but sometimes when I take a more humble, soft-spoken approach and say, you know what, I'm not going to control the way you do it because I respect you enough to know that you're a smart kid. And I respect you enough to know that you know what's best, that you know you need to do this. So instead, you don't have to do it my way. As long as this gets done within my expectations, within my boundaries, do it a creative way. You teach me the better way how to do it. I, 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 again, that's a five minute answer to a hard question, but I, I want you to kind of begin there and again, feel free to email me on the site. We've got all kinds of, we've got a newsletter we send out for strong-willed kids, right? To, to kind of help because these kids are hard and it's not easy, but it's going to stretch you, right? To do things in a different way. But that ownership, um, another word while we're on this is, um, hey, when you're ready. Now you can't use when you're ready for, we've got to go to the doctor's office or we've got to go someplace. But sometimes that phrase, like when a child is upset saying, hey, when you're ready, I could really use help building with these Legos or coloring this thing over here. Sometimes that phrase, when you're ready, almost releases them to come help versus, I need you to do this right now because his initial response is no. And you felt that and you can hear that. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. You know, um, Kirk, one of the things that several people have posted is is, um, how can I explain this? As a parent, they, even if they know this intellectually, it's really hard to keep their cool. So some person, one person wrote a great um, statement about how, you know, um, they're just so busy and they're type A parents. They're all working. They have repeated reminders and their child just continues to not follow instructions. On they just seem to lose it. I mean, and and stress, you know, and they know they don't have enough patience, but somehow, you know, feeling like as a parent, they really need help being that empathetic, you know, parent. You have any suggestions for that? We've all been there, right? Yeah. Yes. If we had five hours, it would be awesome. But here's <laughs> no. uh, these because, you know, what? that's honestly, in the, you know, in the early days, our organization was called Celebrate ADHD. And because I wanted to take a, a more wow. positive approach and we changed it to celebrate calm because we had all these kids in our home. But what I found is so much of it is just how we interact as parents. Right. I'm a type so A, important. Right. I'm a type A driven guy. And so I'll give you the conceptual thing first and then we'll hit with a couple of real practical things. Conceptually and principally it's this, if what you're doing right now is not working, you've got to try something different, right? Like I get the type A, like, listen, we lived in Washington, D.C. for a while, that Northern Virginia area. We lived in Atlanta. We've lived in some busy places, right? So you've got a lot of stuff to do. But you can't, you can't force your kids into that, right? I mean, these are kids who are very good thinkers. Some of them are slower processors. And, and some of it I tell parents is you're going to have to intentionally and purposefully slow your life down. And I know this kind of sounds funny, but I would put in your planner every afternoon or evening, like block out 30 minutes for just something to go wrong. Because the conceit of modern day parents is, listen, if I read enough books, if I do it the right way, my kids will listen and will just, you know what, I'm gonna set up them for success and they're gonna do well in school and I'm gonna make everything just work well through the sheer force of my type A personality. My, some of you are agenda people, right? You got an agenda every day of what you're gonna get through. You're not getting through it all because that's not how life works. And I'd rather you have 30 minutes set aside for the meltdown for that child who's struggling with anxiety. And you know what, and I mean this, I would rather have you some nights 
send a note into the teacher saying, hey, last night we didn't get homework done, but you know what we did? I spent 45 minutes teaching my child how to calm himself down when he gets upset. I spent 30 minutes teaching my son impulse control. So we didn't get homework done, but we, we worked on some really valuable life skills last night. And you know, most teachers are gonna be like, yep, that's really helpful. So a couple of quick things as type A parents. Um, you're gonna have to internalize some of this. The quickest way to change your child's behavior is to first control your own. The quickest way to change your child's behavior is to first control your own. So your body posture, your tone of voice makes all the difference. Picture, if you run into the child's bedroom in the morning or come home from work at night and start barking out orders, 100% of the time you will get resistance. It just happens. Picture this, standing, uh, looking at your child with your hands on your hips. Is anything good about to happen in that situation? No, never, ever, ever because all it tells them is, I'm anxious, I'm frustrated, and watch this tone. Uh, uh, listen, Jacob, 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 we, we, uh, get, you need to get your shoes on because we, does that ever end well? Never, because you don't want your spouse saying, honey, honey, honey. You'd be like, oh, Winnie's the marriage therapist, right? You're not, so I'll give you something and it's gonna sound so simple, but you can do this. Tonight when you come home, and everything's chaotic in a rush, sit down. And I mean this, I want you to sit in the middle of the living room floor. The next time your child is disobeying, the next time your child is upset, the next time your child is arguing with you, the next time two siblings are fighting, lay down, sit down in the middle of the living room floor, don't say a word and watch what happens. And I guarantee you almost every time, you will change the entire dynamic of that situation by simply changing your body posture and your tone of voice. When I disciplined 1,500 kids in my home, I always disciplined sitting down, crossing my legs, and using an even matter-of-fact tone. Because once you start getting a little bit emotional, you can hear that, right? Guys, after all I do for you, I work, I cook for you, I clean, all it tells them is, uh-oh, the adult in the home is out of control I'm already out of control, and now the adult is actually, there's no guilt in this, by the way, but it's just truth. The adult in the home is now dependent on how I behave, because if I don't behave as a child, my parent's going to lose it, and once the parent loses it, the child's in complete control. So, I, I, again, I, I, I don't mean to uh, push our stuff, but that's a big part of what we do at Celebrate Calm, that, like if you come to a live workshop, the first 30 minutes have nothing to do with your kids and everything to do with how do you just control yourself in the midst? You know, pick, let me give you one other. Mom, you're in the middle of, you just got home from work or you stayed home with your kids, whatever it is, and you're cooking dinner and you've got three kids. One's always going to be melting down about something insignificant. Two others are arguing with each other. Maybe another one's not doing his homework. And we have saying, guys, you know what? I try to help. I just need a little bit of help. And now see, it becomes me as the parent needing the child to behave rather than me taking back control and saying, guys, I know exactly what's going on in here. And me using that tone because that even matter of fact tone says, listen, I've seen this before. I've done this before. I've handled meltdowns in public before. And what I'm really saying is your world is out of control right now, but mine's not. I can deal with this. And you know what the, the funny part is at the office, we deal with this stuff all the time and that's how we do it. Nobody goes through their home, their office yelling, you know what, I asked for that report, you can't even give me, right? I mean, that doesn't happen, but we do it to our kids and we expect them to, to respond. So again, I wish you know we had five hours, but I do that one thing, change your body posture and your tone of voice tonight. That, that phrase, I'm curious, is a really powerful rather than what were you thinking when you did that? Which is a very demeaning phrase. What were you thinking? Absolutely. Instead, I'm so, Kurt, curious. So. What you mentioned, I think, anxiety. And a lot of kids are really living with a great deal of anxiety. And this is something that's come up with some of our other experts that I find really important. You know, that, you know, I, I, it just rings so true that as an explanation for this 
for resistance, for behavior. And then another question, which I'm going to tee up here in this context, which is sort of very far away from from oppositional behavior, and yet it's something that parents are driven crazy by. Two people have said, my child is very smart, he's in accelerated classes, but he just keeps forgetting to turn his homework in. Um, another person says, help, my son never turns anything in. So um, in this case, you know, <laughs> they're wondering. They it's very common, right? It, right, right. What's going on and how do they deal with it without nagging? And, you know, so, I mean, I just wonder, is this an anxiety situation that, that, that prompts this, or is it more impulsivity, disorganization, ADHD, or I, I think don't know? It's, that's great, and it's very common. I think it's a couple things. One is, I think it's um, short-term memory and mm -hmm. just forgetting things. These are kids with very, here's a non-technical term, they've got very busy brains. They're thinking about 100 things at once. And part of it, to be honest, is it's just not that important to them. You know what I mean? It's a, see, here's the hard part about parental anxiety. Well, I, 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 I know you did your homework, and I want you to turn it in, because if you don't turn in your homework, you won't get a good grade. And if you don't get a good grade, you won't do well in school. You won't be able to go to college, and then you won't get a job. Nobody's going to marry you, right? We go through this whole thing in our head, <laughs> right? And we project out. But if I'm dealing with a 9-year-old or even a 16-year-old boy, especially, or a girl, it's like turning in my homework on the list of my priorities comes somewhere in around like number 678. So some of, it's a, some of it's a motivation thing, right? Like I did my homework, but it's not top of mind. So remember we talked about tools, giving kids tools. So I'll give you a tool that we use a lot and I love it. Some parents don't, but I love it. You can buy a scanner for like 10 bucks cheap. So your child comes home, does his homework, you scan the homework in, like it's a written page or something, you scan it in, and then he emails his homework right then to his teacher. I'm great with that because I have a lot of teachers who will make it a game and say, hey, you've got homework tonight. Bet you can't be the first one who scans it in and emails it to me. And what I've done is, look, there's a gray area there, right? Of he did his homework and then he turned it in. He just turned it in proactively. That's a smart workaround. I do stuff like that in my own life a lot. I don't have great memory. My brain's busy. So right after this, right after I get off of this, I have an appointment to go to. By my front door, I have all my stuff laid out. Like I laid it out like an hour and a half before this because I know my mind's going to be busy. Well, that's a workaround, and that's a smart thing. It's a tool to use. Now, some of it is this. Your child just doesn't care. But you care, but no amount of nagging is going to help it. So I like this phrase, which is this. Again, it's giving the child ownership to say, listen, I respect you enough to know that you're bright enough, to know that the homework needs to be turned in. It's not my job as your mommy anymore to remind you to do that. So I'm going to leave that. You and your teacher work that out. And sometimes when you stop owning it, it allows them to own it. Another one might be, um, the sun going allow you to own it. So if you want to think of a creative way, to turn your homework in and remember that, go for it. Because some of our kids resist everything we say because they don't want to do it your way. And they want to come up with, and again, it's that idea of sometimes when I release and stop trying so hard to control their behavior, it gives them an opportunity to step up and control and own their own behavior, but do it in a different kind of way. Um, I, I wouldn't get too freaked out about that. I know the other one is procrastination. My child waits till the last minute. It's a brain right. stimulation issue. When I wait till the last minute, I get an adrenaline fl uh, rush to my head. It brings blood flow to my brain. It's why kids argue. It is why they pick on siblings. It's brain stimulation. It is why they um, like listening to music sometimes, why they argue with you. It is why they procrastinate, do all those things to get their brain stimulated. And some of it, Honestly, you're not going to change. It's the way they're wired. And some of your kids, like I'll ask a parent, so they procrastinate. Um, what kind of grade did they get on that paper? Oh, they got a good grade. And I'll be like, well, what's the issue? What well, made me really anxious because I wanted them to do, get their work done earlier. So when you asked if it was an anxiety issue, not for the child, but for the parent. So again, when you allow your child to own things a little bit, they're going to fail and they're going to stumble a little bit. 
But you know, your kid, your kids who are made like this, they have to stumble and fail. And I'd rather them do that while they're young because they mm -hmm. learn from that. And it's a really so, important, hard thing to do. There are two parents who posted, who have tried in response to what you said about homework. One said, um, my 12 year old son negotiated on his own with his teacher to do the homework on his iPad and, up and electronically <laughs> uploaded to Google Drive, right? And the other one said, I stepped back, let him, to turn, let him do his own work and he hasn't done anything and he's failing in school. So there you have two different reactions, you know, to, uh, to uh, letting so your child- The first one he stepped up, the second one, I'll mention this very quickly, giving him tools to do homework in different ways, right? So very mm -hmm. creative ways, so going to exercise, ball music, all those different things. The other part is this, get him using his gifts, talents, and passions accountable to another adult. Because if you can get that 11, 12-year-old doing a job of some kind, internship, doing something for someone else that they're good at, and being mm -hmm. held accountable other adults can speak to your kids in ways that you can't because you can nag them all day. School's important. School's important. Don't care. But when they're doing helping some guy with his construction project and that guy's like, hey, you need to get good grades. You need to turn in your homework or you're not going to do construction work with me or you're not going to volunteer at my animal shelter. All of a sudden, your child has a reason to do well in school. They're not going to do it because mommy and daddy want them to. They're going to do it because they care about something and, and using other adults to motivate them is sometimes a very helpful thing. That's a super good idea because motivation is another issue that we just don't have time for that definitely comes up. Well, Kirk, I'm in the camp of Laura who posted, we need another two hours with Kirk. He has tangible tools to help us. Thank you. So we're out of time, very unfortunately, and um, you have just been great as always. And we all um, appreciate everything you do. It's very practical, empathetic, and um, just you know, reaffirming uh, to everyone well, of, uh, that we can do I this. I appreciate so. what you do. If, you, if people you so have much. questions, again, go to our website. We've got a free newsletter. You can email me, and we're pretty good about getting back to people. But thank you, and um, enjoy okay. your children this afternoon. Enjoy them. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.